this. And there we go. Good morning. Good morning. Good uh, morning. This morning, is July 1st of 2014. My name is Pauline Gravier and I am interviewing Dr. Paul and Judy Tobolowski from Dallas, Texas, and they are um, a, an amazing couple who uh, actually, Paul is uh, particularly interesting because of his uh, upbringing in Dallas, which is a little unusual, and then of course for having a second career. So I would like to begin by asking Paul how his family got to Texas, because you have an extensive family. Would you tell us about that? Right. We keep hearing news stories about it all the time, but my grandfather as a teenager, maybe about age 14 or so, left Poland, uh, driven out by pogroms, and he apparently had a brother in North Texas, and he came to be with his brother in North Texas, and from those two, I'm told the family was fertile and multiplied and spread out around North Texas, and we find them in the strangest places now. They found their way to lots of small towns into Dallas, where the main bulk of Tobolowskis live. Um, for instance, some of the small towns, would you Hubbard, know? Texas. Wichita Falls, Texas, where else? There are relatives that you don't know in those areas. There's a, Just a, small towns. Yes. There's That's a okay. famous baseball player named Tris Speaker of the ancient days of baseball whose best friend was a Tobolowski in some little town in Texas. So. Interesting. And was it always dry goods or what, what kind of businesses? My, my father's father, Abraham Benjamin Topolowski, didn't know a word of English when he immigrated and apparently the family kept horses and he went around selling household items on a cart pulled by two horses and I'm told he had a one week route to be back by the Sabbath and he had a two week route and there was a Jewish family he would stay with often sleeping on the ground or in a barn uh, up for the Sabbath night so he could be with the Jewish family on Shabbat. What a wonderful story. And then who came to Dallas first, or do you know? My uh, grandfather, A.B. Tobolowski, and his route was through this now densely settled area, but then it was all rural, uh, the North Dallas suburbs. Do you remember the year that he first came, uh, the, the, you said he was escaping pogroms, about what year would you say? It was in the late 1800s. I wasn't born until 1947 <laughs> and by then uh, I was horrified to find that he was driving a car and let's say I hope he was safer with a, with a horse and wagon than he was <laughs> with a car. He had one signal, he would stick his arm out the window and that meant he was going to do something. And that, that was his universal signal. And even at my young age, I realized this was a terrifying experience. <laughs> that too is a wonderful story. <laughs> well, his horse didn't need much more than that, did he? No, I, I'm told he, he faced the decision when one of the horses died, whether to get another horse or get a car. And at some point, he decided to get a car. Unfortunately, there was not as much traffic on Hillcrest at the time, and he was able to survive to uh, almost 90 years old wow. just by driving the way he did. It's amazing. He was a colorful character indeed. You mentioned Hillcrest, which is in the north part of Dallas, but where did you grow up? Uh, we grew up in Oak Cliff. Our family did. I'd mentioned Tefer de Israel. The cornerstone of Tefer de Israel is to my grandfather from his children. But my father, Dave Tobolowski, who's been interviewed, uh, Dave was born April 15th, 1922, and Dave was a pediatrician and he had started a pediatrics practice in Oak Cliff. The baseball team, the minor league baseball team, was in Oak Cliff 
and the zoo was in Oak Cliff so that the kids would have an activity. And so he started his practice in Oak Cliff and then when the rest of the Dallas Jewish population moved to North Dallas, he faced the decision of whether to give up on his practice and start from scratch in North Dallas or to stay where he was and to keep his practice and he decided it was too hard to start a medical practice from scratch again. So he elected to stay in Oak Cliff and so I turned out to be the only Jewish person in a Kimball High School class of over 800. We graduated in 1965. So my friends weren't Jewish. I didn't know what it was like to date a Jewish girl. The only contact I had them had with other Jews was in Sunday school. And we went for a while to Tefer de Israel and for a while to Temple Emmanuel. And other than my cousin Martin Toby, everyone else in the class I didn't know. And they seemed to know each other. So it made being a teenager awkward times 10 being in this group of people that I didn't know who all seemed to know each other. And so it was, it was awkward, but I had an idyllic childhood, really. Uh, my parents were just wonderful people, and I don't know, Pauline, to what extent you've gotten to meet them, but my mother, June Tobolowsky, was just so fun-loving, and everyone she met, she was just so joyful. And my dad was just, he is still a fabulous person. He's 92 now and was always my role model. So any flaws in me are not due to my parents. Uh, they were, I, I was very blessed. Paul, did you have any siblings? I have a moderately famous sibling. My brother Stephen Tobolowsky is an actor. I'm 65. Stephen would be 62 now. and. He's been living in Los Angeles and made a nice professional career as an actor and he wrote a book as well. And he was a Tony Award nominee back about 15 years ago in a play called Mornings at Seven on Broadway. And I have a sister who's a professor at the University of Texas at Arlington and she's been in higher education as her specialty. And then you, as an internist, what an, a, a very talented family. It sounds like being the only Jew in a class of 800, and they went through the same type of education. It sounds like you didn't suffer too much. You, were all, you are all successful. Well, my dad was, as I say, my role model, other than he was a pediatrician, and in those days, uh, they, there were solo doctors. He was a solo doctor who was on call essentially all the time. Mm -hmm. People would call our house all day, all night, and he never was off duty. It eventually came to pass that he would be exchanging call with another doctor Thursday afternoons, so he had a few hours off each week. But I decided that was all work and no play and would be not the lifestyle I chose. So I chose to do internal medicine because I wanted relationships with people and uh, I'm delighted that I made that choice. It was a very fulfilling career and I got a chance to meet you too. I'm delighted you <laughs> made that choice too. <laughs> and Judy, you have been sitting so patiently. You are I have seen you when and Paul does his speeches about his book, and you are, in my view, the the perfect, the perfect spouse. You have you're patient, you look interested, and and you're very attractive. And I just learned that you're from New York. Could you tell us about your upbringing and how you got to Texas? Well, mine was a little bit different from Paul's. Uh, my parents, my grandparents both came in to uh, Lower Manhattan through Ellis Island, and my parents were both born in uh, the Lower East Side of New York. They met in Florida um, and got married, and I was born in Brooklyn. I lived in Brooklyn until I was six and a half, and then we moved to Long Island, where pretty much everyone was Jewish. My school was all Jewish, my elementary school, my high school was all Jewish. There were multiple synagogues and temples in the area. 
So it never occurred to me that I would be living any place that was different. You know, I didn't have that experience. It was all Jewish. We, I went to Boston for um, graduate school, to Boston University in speech pathology, and I met Paul after I was working there for a number of years. We started dating and decided eventually that we would get married and move to Texas. And I've been and here 35 years. Now, how long ago was that that you came to Dallas? 1979. And you were there for school also? I uh, graduated from Southwestern Medical School in 1973, mm -hmm. and I was class president in uh, the Southwestern Medical School class of 73, Upjohn Award winner, graduation speaker da -da. in 1973. Wonderful. I peaked too young. <laughs> That's a joke. And, uh, I, yeah. I, uh, so I enjoyed working at a city hospital, Parkland, and I got lots of responsibility as someone training at Parkland Hospital, and I thought I will pick another part of the world that I might not otherwise have a chance to get to know, and I will apply for an internship at the city hospital there. So I ended up at Boston City Hospital, which no longer exists, but it, it was, was a big hospital. It was a big, uh, rough, ragged hospital. It was a tough place, and I, I learned a lot. It was physically and psychologically challenging, but one of my uh, fellow interns threw a party and invited me, and he invited a friend of Judy's, and the friend of Judy's mentioned it to Judy, and I am ever so glad that Judy crashed the party. <laughs> <laughs> That's an exciting story, too. Good for you. I wouldn't say she exactly crashed it. She Not exactly. I knew somebody who knew the person. Yeah. <laughs> that is wonderful. So you came to Dallas. You told me earlier that you thought you would be an ER doc and had trained for that. And then you switched. Did that cost you any more time, training no. time? I actually trained in internal medicine. But during the years where we were just trying to decide what to do after I finished my internal medicine training program, we were still living in the Boston area, and I, on a month-by-month -month basis, did ER work to support myself. Mm -hmm. So that ended up three years of emergency room work, and it was uh, that's a nice area to do emergency room work. I did 24-hour shifts, which at that young age was something I was used to. I, during the course of my internship and residency, I often would work longer shifts than that, where you're every third night on call all night and all the next day. So I was used to being away 36, 40 hours at a time and working all that time. So I did seven 24-hour shifts a month as an emergency room doctor, leaving me lots of free time. and. Uh, I had a girlfriend. What a thrill. I, was, I After missing a decade, I finally met a nice Jewish girl in my late 20s. Uh, I was 29 when we met, and Judy was 28. And uh, we've had lots of fun since then. I agree with you that uh, she, was, uh, she was an ideal uh, friend uh, Indeed. to go through life with. Indeed. Well, now, tell us, you have children. Yes. And yeah, how many? Three what? children. Three? Um, I just wanted to tell you, it was a kind of a difficult decision to move to Dallas. Mm -hmm. I had a job in Boston mm -hmm. that I loved. I a, a speech pathologist. Speech like pathology. This. I worked in the Wellesley Public Schools, and I loved the job. And I, loved, I had a lot of friends that I was very close to in Boston. My mother um, was sick at the time. She died just before we got married, making it a little bit easier to leave. Uh, my father was still there. But we moved here, and in, in 1982, we had a daughter, Deborah. And in 1985, we had twin sons, Mark and Andrew. Well, that must have been exciting for the entire Topolovsky family it and was. yours. And I'm an only child, so it was very different for me. But I had wonderful, they had wonderful grandparents who took, helped us in every way possible. Isn't that wonderful? That's exciting. Were they fraternal or identical? Fraternal. Fraternals. And, and those wonderful grandparents were my parents, June and Dave, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. 
uh, Judy's mother, as she mentioned, had died. We, we actually got married twice, once unofficially, when we realized that Judy's mother wasn't going to live long enough to make it to our scheduled wedding. So uh, their rabbi was kind enough to go through the ceremony with us, but he pointed out that it didn't count as an official service, but we went through, we celebrate that uh, ceremony as well as our real wedding date, our official wedding date. And then when we moved back here, my parents had been stranded when my brother and sister also left to pursue their careers. So my parents were delighted to have family back in town. We, there's a big extended Topolowski family too, but uh, there's to some us, what in the. Uh, there's a big extended Topolosky family, yes. Yes. and so my my parents always had that, but once we moved back to town and they had grandchildren, mm -hmm. uh, they made superb grandparents. Isn't that, you're so fortunate, aren't you? I yeah. am. Now, were there any special challenges with moving back to Dallas, was it, and, and coming into the Jewish part of Dallas, in North Dallas, was there any particular advantage or disadvantage to that, would you say? Because you didn't know a lot of people. Right. But I was aware that there was that hole in my life that uh, I wanted to fill. And the Jewish Community Center, I heard, had a basketball league. And I'm the typical Jewish basketball player in that I have like a one-inch vertical leap, but I, <laughs> I like winning a lot more than I like losing, and I was uh, very competitive at sports. I'm not competitive at other aspects of life, but I had a wonderful time playing basketball and tennis at the Jewish Community Center Leagues and met lots of friends many of which became my patients, many of which became our ongoing friends. And uh, so the JCC was a great place for us to finally hook up with uh, a lot of people in the Dallas Jewish community. Well, that, that is certainly a wonderful tribute to sports, of course, and the JCC. So. And our children started Mother's Day out here and, and went to preschool all the way through kindergarten. All of our children did that. That's, so they're used to it, and they mm -hmm. come over. Or do does anybody live in Dallas? No, none of them live in Dallas at the moment. Oh, so are your grandparents too? No, one of our um, sons is getting married in a year, and we hope eventually to have grandchildren, but not at this point. One hopes, but <laughs> <laughs> that does not always happen. And did anybody follow you into medicine, Paul? No. We have two lawyers uh, uh, amongst our three children. We have my daughter and one of my sons uh, are lawyers in the Washington, D.C. area. And their other son went into religious studies. He's a Ph.D. student at Brown mm -hmm. in Providence, Rhode Island. And he's finished all of it but the dissertation part. He should have that done within a year. So then he'll be job hunting. Yes, what type studies. of work would he do? He knows, he knows a lot about history of the ancient Mideast and uh, a lot about ancient religions. He'd like to be a professor, that's his goal, to be a professor at a university. So stay in academics. Yes. Right. That's the world he likes. Mm -hmm. Good, good for him. Uh, he's been to Israel, of course, yes. many times. Does he speak Hebrew fluently? Or? No, he can read <laughs> Biblical Hebrew. Okay. Um, he doesn't There's, know too much modern Hebrew. There is a difference. There is. There, a difference. there is. Well, I am a, making an assumption that when you were young, Judy, that you did not have... Uh, do you have siblings? and no. Okay, so you, you, you did say that you were an only child. Um, when you were in school, I am assuming, since everybody, everybody, almost everybody was Jewish, that you didn't have any um, anti-Semitic cracks or comments to deal with. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that at all. In the okay, and, and school let out on Rosh Hashona and Yom Kippur. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Fascinating, isn't it? And Our children Paul, had a different experience. Pardon? Our children had a slightly different experience. Really? Yeah. 
Okay, can you tell us about that? Well, we moved to North Dallas, um, just behind Medical City, and there were some Jews, Jewish families in the, in the neighborhood. But when our children started first grade, when our daughter started first grade, she was one of four Jewish kids in the class. Um, and it was there that at some point in, in her early elementary age, elementary grades, she was asked if she believed in Jesus and was told that if she didn't believe in Jesus, she would go to hell. And I had never encountered anything like that. And there were another, a number of other slightly oh, not such nice things said. Not really anti-Semitism as, as such, but almost an unawareness of the things that could be said that would be not, what, not taken well. When she heard that and she answered, and, um, we're certainly proud of her for not for not just saying, yes, I do, and, and the easy way out. Uh, were there any other repercussions? Did the kids isolate her or, or anything? No, no, the only, um, I think she was very, they were very proud of their Jewishness. Having gone to the JCC, they had a strong sense of being Jew Jewish, and they did go to um, Sunday school at Temple Emanuel. Um, the only other thing that happened in, the, in elementary school through high school, actually, is when they were, for the Jewish holidays, of course, they would take off, and I'd have to write a note. And teachers didn't, some teachers understood and were very accepting of it, others were not as accepting of it. So if there was a test being taken that day, they'd have to make it up very, very soon afterwards. There were no excused, it was an excused absence, but I had to ask every year for it. And when I, when I grew up in Dallas, I was not really bothered by the fact that every day would begin with a blessing over the loudspeaker, which was usually a Christian prayer at Kimball High School in Oak Cliff, and then at lunch there would also be a prayer before before lunch every day. And again, it just slid off me. I didn't pay attention to it or feel threatened by it. I just thought that's the way the world works, or at least that's the way the neighborhood works, and no one ever said anything to the one Jew in the, in the class. No one ever made an anti-Semitic comment. Uh, Everybody was friendly, and so I, I had no complaints. My father's generation was different, where uh, he went to the medical school, Southwestern Medical School, Parkland Hospital training program, and they only had a couple of Jewish slots, and one of which he got. And so he, he knew what it was like to feel prejudiced, and I, and, and I never felt prejudiced against May. Were you as athletic in high school as you were when you came back as a young doctor? Well, I played sports every day, but you may have not noticed, Pauline, but I'm actually really scrawny, and those high school football players are 250 yeah. pounds, and I decided being hit by a 250-pound person didn't really figure into my long-term picture what I wanted in life. So I would play football with my buddies, or basketball, or tennis, or baseball, depending upon the What season. about the basketball? That's where you seem to excel as an adult. I, I, I probably am best uh, at tennis because it's not violent and no one knocks me around. <laughs> and and uh, so I still love playing sports, but I have quit anything that requires keeping score. So if I play tennis with someone, we just hit the ball around. I was, as I mentioned, very competitive about sports in my younger years, and that changed from being a feeling I loved to a feeling that I did not love. and I. I got to where I had trouble watching sports and participating in sports that required keeping score. So I still like, if, if someone will throw a baseball with me after this interview, I would love it, but that's probably not going to happen. That's, I think, a very adult view, <laughs> and tennis is a great sport. Well, what's your life like now? Now, I know that you uh, went and had a successful practice. I certainly know that from experience. Uh, and then you retired. Now tell us about that. Well, you know my secret. Uh, I, uh, during my years working as a doctor, I had a revelation. And it started when I was a child learning Bible stories in Sunday school. 
And I thought, why do all those biblical miracles not happen to me? Why do seas not part for me like they did in the Bible? And my hope, even as an adolescent, was that at some time in my life, I would have one of those biblical scale miracles happen in my own life to me. And the miracle of choice I selected was the burning bush story. I wanted one of those burning bushes that's not consumed by fire. And those are hard to come by, it would seem. But I came to realize, and I should have realized it decades before I did, that all of us are burning and not consumed by the fire. We literally are metabolically burning and not consumed by the fire. So it turned out that the miracle that I had been seeking my whole life was me. And I discovered this when I was about 40 years old or so. So I hoped at some time in my life that I would retire and have time to explore this and write about how amazing, how miraculous we are without realizing it, without realizing that our ordinary selves are so amazing. I want to come back to that for just, can, can we put a bookmark in that, bookmark right, in right that. there? Because I want to go to Judy at this time. He comes in, he's about 40 years old or a little older, and he comes in with this revelation and he starts talking to you about it. And how are you really feeling inside <laughs> about this? Well, he always wrote. Um, when we, before we were married, he wrote songs. And after we were married, he wrote a poem for our wedding. He always wrote. He was always writing parts of parts of chapters that he hoped about ultimately would be a book. Uh, and I read all versions of it. Do you, did you understand what he was saying? Did Mostly. You buy um, into I don't have a really strong science background, so I learned a lot of science over the years. I heard it enough times, read it enough times, that I began to understand it. You are miraculous. You are the perfect listener. You listen to Paul as though you've never, ever heard it before. And it's wonderful because everybody in the audience looks at you and there you are just attentive and nodding. <laughs> and then you, <laughs> you, you act as his booking agent, as his uh, bookkeeper. What, what, so me. much. Um, when he, he had an editor for the book and I also helped edit it. So that between the three of us, we edited the book. And I kind of consider myself his groupie. <laughs> so I go to all the talks, and they're always a little different. So I always en enjoy listening to how he changes it. And I learn a little more each time. Um, he does his own bookings for the most part, but I keep track of the small monetary aspect of it. Yeah. Pay, well, the, the taxes, things like that. It's that, that's wonderful because she truly is your partner. and. It, that's a, a very exciting thing to see. Good. It is exciting. I'm, Good. I'm very proud of it. We, we went to a lecture 20 years ago on Jewish marriages, and I forget the Hebrew terms, but there are different kinds of Jewish marriages, and one of the kind is where the other person is the other part of yourself. It said that there's some marriages that are wonderful marriages, but the people are very different and they're always having to make trade-offs and that you're the luckiest of all if what you find is the other aspect of yourself and your spouse. And I felt we were blessed with having that kind of marriage and I, I can't think of me without thinking of Judy. Uh, she has been the part of me that I'm not. And uh, I just can't believe my good luck, especially as I say, I wasn't exposed to Jewish girls for most of my life, for most of my dating life. Mm -hmm. And uh, to find uh, Judy uh, was the, I can't imagine my good luck. I still can't believe it. That's so romantic. It is. It's very sweet. <laughs> it, it, it really is. And you. I don't know how old you were when you got married, but it's pretty obvious that you reciprocate those feelings, too. Yes. I was 30 when we got, got married. We've been married 35 years, and they've been wonderful. The, um, the dedication, my, my little book there, Stardust Dancing, A Seeker's Guide to the Miraculous, 
And one reason that I wrote the book was to be able to write these words in the acknowledgement in, in addition to taking the cover photo of the author. Okay? Judy Tabolowski contributed to the book in many other ways. She co-edited it, compiled the endnotes and bibliography, assisted with word selection, and provided much needed wisdom and support. The freedom of self-publishing this book allows me to admit that I love Judy Tabolowski and always will. And so I wrote a whole book partly expressing myself, but it gave me the opportunity to uh, uh, give thanks. Uh, I have been so blessed in this life uh, to have a marriage, uh, to have a life made like GD. I think anybody who's watching this video will will have some tears in their <laughs> eyes in hearing that. That's truly a love story. It's wonderful. Um, we've had we've been very blessed with our children too. We have three wonderful children. Now one is getting married. One is getting married. And what do they do? Well, we, we already told you that two of them are lawyers. Oh, two are. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Two are the lawyers. Uh, and then, did anybody follow you? No. Nobody followed. No. You. Two and, lawyers, and the one who's getting married is the one who's getting a PhD. And that's right. You did tell me. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's right. Judy, have you ever done any of your of your pathology, your speech pathology work? I worked for ten years in Massachusetts before we got married. And when I came here, I worked for a year, and then I retired for 20 years while we had children. And then I went back part-time, I guess it's about 14 years ago now, so I work part-time, I still do. And you're still part-time? Mm -hmm. That's terrific. What's the part of it that you like the most? I like working with kids. I like being able to help them, and it's always different. Every child, of course, every person is different. And when you see some, have some success, it's very gratifying. It's not instantaneous success, though. Yeah. No, it's, it's long-term it's long sometimes, and you have to adjust your goals accordingly so that you see little changes and little goals. But I really enjoy the challenge of it. I enjoy being, trying to figure out how to help. Good for you to still keep your hand in because you don't want to lose all of those years of training and experience. That's, right. Well, and I did retire for 20 years, but... I used to keep track of all of our children's um, words when they were very young. <laughs> well, that's, that's a, a wonderful compromise, I it would was. say, between professionalism and then moving into a professional side of mm -hmm. raising children and, yes. the, and then going back yeah. again. And I kept my license, so I was that's, able to go back. That's very, uh, uh, sounds like a good way to do it to me. <laughs> that, it was. I was very lucky that I could do it. Yes. 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 No. Left unsaid thus far is Judy's also a skilled pianist, mm -hmm. and uh, you can tell about your piano career. The part she doesn't remember is her mother, who was also a pianist, encouraged Judy to play, saying someday it will get you a husband, and she was <laughs> right about that. But uh, you why, can tell about why that. Why was that? That was her belief, and it, it helped. Um, there were a number of years here, I guess in the early 90s that I was the pianist for the National Council of Jewish Women Singers and they would go to different nursing homes and um, different facilities and, and sing and I would play. Like and then you made more friends. Made more friends, yes. Terrific. And has music continued to be part of your lives? Do you do symphony? Do you? Um, From time to time we do. We do symphony, we do opera. Paul plays the guitar all the time. I play oh. the piano some of the time. Oh. <laughs> it's uh, too bad because I'm a terrible guitarist and I play all the yeah. time. And she's an excellent pianist and she doesn't play enough. But we, when we dated, our chief day was she would play the piano and I would sing. And that was actually lots of fun. And we, we don't do it as much as we used to. I, I, I don't sing as well as I used to, and she... Do you sing uh, better than you play guitar? Better than I play <laughs> guitar, yes. <laughs> this is better than uh, this. Uh, yes, um, I wrote about 20 to 25 songs, but I wrote them mostly before I became so joyful about mm -hmm. life. There's not the same drive to write songs when you're really happy 
uh, when I was living by myself in one-room apartments in Boston and it would be winter and it'd be minus 10 degrees and snowing and dark at four in the <laughs> afternoon. That's the stuff you write songs about. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so she ruined my songwriting career by making me happy. And uh, so I've, uh, but I still write, occasionally write a song. He wrote a song when our daughter was born, which is absolutely beautiful. Oh, have you ever recorded it? Well, we, with today's technology, we can make recordings, and so we have recorded me at, at various times doing some of the songs, including the one that uh, that I wrote the day our daughter was born. Which was and a very I'm, happy occasion. So a very happy, that's right. a very, and I've been up all night, but yes. it was a very happy occasion. What a, what a wonderful talent to have. So you have not only the talent for writing books, but you also are a composer. That's extraordinary. The, uh, the melodies are simple and they're lyric driven. So it's the poetry of it, I think, that moves the, my songs forward. But I, I still like them and I sing in the shower. Uh, not with a guitar. Would you I, consider, you realize this, this tape is going to, or you, this video is going to go to you, it's going to be on our website, and it's really for children, grandchildren, people in the community, people who are studying. Would you consider singing um, like you were in the shower, just one, a, par, a portion of one, maybe? Wow, and I'm, I'm hoarse this morning. The, 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 uh, the one that we talked about uh, when there was born. My child, my baby child, a dream beyond believing, a magic of creation, eternity unfolding, and so on. Oh, that's a lovely. That is beautiful. That is beautiful. That is beautiful. Our daughter has a copy of it and cherishes it. Good, good. We should write a song have, when our sons were born, though. <laughs> so I wish exhausting. you wouldn't have stopped. <laughs> That's exciting. Yeah. And and now let me focus in on Paul and get Paul to talk more about his about his book because it's obvious that he didn't have to retire. He retired because he wanted to write this book. So tell us about that, would you? Well, I partly I retired because I wanted to write the book, uh, Pauline, but partly I retired because doctoring was changing. I think you were aware of this. The, I had started as a solo physician and I could set up my own schedule and I would take two hours off in the middle of the day so that if I didn't have hospital work, I could go home, have lunch, play with the children if I knew a patient was going to take a long time, I could give them a long time. And then I found myself in this more corporatized setting where people would be given 15 minute appointments and I had no control of that. And it was not, I, I, I still really enjoyed the people part of it and it became difficult for me. The daughter would take time off from work and bring the 85-year-old mother into the office and they'd have a list of 15 problems <laughs> and they'd have a 15-minute appointment. So the way I, normally I would have given that person an hour if I had control of my schedule. So as it was, the way I practiced was basically becoming obsolete in not not in a scientific sense obsolete, but it just didn't work out that I could spend as much time with each patient as I felt I needed to. Simply wasn't satisfying for you. The, I would work right through lunch to catch up from how far I'd be getting more and more behind as the morning would go on. I couldn't tell someone, let's take the top two problems off your list today and make another appointment. So the time had come where it was really right for me to retire. And so the book gave me a project to look forward to. And it, as I say, once I had my breakthrough, the ordinary life was miraculous. Then all I had to do was explore ordinary life. And it turned my ordinary life into just uh, a playground 
I started looking at all the things that I used to walk past and thinking what well, was going on. I could look at a tree now or a, I could look at grass and think about what's really going on. And the, the, that grass, people have measured the roots, that a little tuft of grass would have hundreds of miles of root structure that's going on out of sight underground. But I mostly thought about people and how amazing we all are. And I had discovered that as a doctor. And so as a doctor, the way I practiced was, I realized that this person that I was dealing with was miraculous. And I thought, well, I'm miraculous too. So I would try with the miraculous, the sense of the miraculous within me to engage the miraculous within my patient. And then I realized it doesn't have to be a doctor-patient relationship. It can be any human interaction. So I started thinking of all the people that I know, all the conversations that I have and interactions that I have in terms of how miraculous this is that we're able to share the world together and speak and understand each other. And I, I still just look at my life as a miracle and a world of miracles. And I am delighted people such as yourself have been nice enough to offer me the, the chance to tell people how amazing they are. I like your title of your book. Tell us about how that came to pass. Stardust Dancing refers to the fact that all the atoms that are now us were once floating around the galaxy. So we literally are made of stardust. In fact, the entire Earth, is, these atoms that were floating in the galaxy are gathered together to form the Earth. So all the atoms of Earth were once floating around the galaxy. So you could either think of the planet itself as stardust dancing in the way that some of these atoms of the planet bunch together and form living things. Uh, you can likewise think of yourself and everyone else you know as stardust dancing, the, that stardust atoms from space can become people like us who have the opportunity to appreciate what an amazing thing it is to be alive. Do many people get it? Do they? Are they just sort of stunned to hear someone who's so confident, so content? Well, you're not. I wouldn't. Content is sort of a, a bland word, but you, who is thoroughly enjoying his life, and who has written about something that should be something that we all know, but it's not. And have you found that people can easily accept it, or what is the reaction that most people have? I think my, almost all the talks have been great fun. I think there's a different degree of understanding in any group, but for some people it's just the right talk and just the right book. And so I have had people buy 15 copies and give them as gifts. Uh, and there will be other people, good friends of mine, saying that they really didn't understand parts of it. So I, I think actually Judy and the editor were selected for that role because they were not science people, they were smart people. And I wanted them to make sure that it was fun for someone who didn't understand science. And as you say, I'm just talking about ordinary life. But if you think about what your eyes do, what your ears do, what your heart does, it's, uh, it's also seemingly impossible, so improbable, all these things that are everyday parts of what we do that we so easily take for granted. So I, I find in pretty much every talk there will be somebody there for whom it's just the right talk. And I really have not had to work at booking in the sense that someone who goes to one talk will invite me to give a similar talk at, at another place. Mm -hmm. So at least at this point it's been uh, self-sustaining and I hope that continues. I hope certainly hope so too. Is there a thought of a follow-up book or a new book? Uh, not really. 
uh, I get asked that, but I think I'd keep writing the same, <laughs> the same thing. Once you realize that that's, I, I feel like the book was written through me, Pauline. I feel like it's not as if I, Paul Tobolowsky, sat down and had these ideas. It, I, I feel like somehow these ideas were given to me and it's my role to spread this little bit to the, the few people that will be my audience. I'm not famous, I won't be a national figure like my semi-famous brother who people know around the country and around the world. So uh, all my talks have been in the Dallas area to this point, but uh, it's the same being a doctor, you can't heal the world, you just hope that you can do the best you can with the people who find you. And there was, uh, there was someone who posted on the internet two nights ago encouraging people that got to buy this book. And this is someone that I haven't met. I hope to meet them someday. So I, I, it's not like any other book or any other song, it's perfect for some people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I uh, am just so grateful that I had this opportunity, this life-changing experience, mm -hmm. because it's really elevated what I do. Before, before I realized how miraculous everything was, I thought in terms of diagnoses and treatments, okay. like doctors do, and I didn't think about miraculous me trying to sustain this miracle that I have the the blessing, the opportunity to try to to sustain in the patients that came to see me. Uh, you knew you knew my most amazing one very well. And I uh, so it's changed my life and I hope to share this message as long as I can share the message. I think that is truly extraordinary, Paul, and um, it is very rare to meet someone who has successfully done what he set out to do and do it twice. That is really remarkable. Thank you for an extraordinary interview. Uh, thank you for being such a wonderful part of my life, Pauline. We've, uh, it, you're, you're so important to me too, and I'm very grateful that you're the one that got to do the interview, and uh, I thank you. Do, do you want to talk about that? Because I, I don't want to cut you off if you, if you would like to talk about the, the A story or two stories or anything, or shall we leave it? Well, I, I think uh, Pauline was, blessed to be married to Dr. Leonard Gravier, and uh, Leonard and I had every now and then passed in the hallways of Medical City Hospital. We didn't really know each other, and one day Leonard became ill, and uh, Leonard's regular doctor was out of town, and I was covering, and Pauline brought Leonard in, and he had what's called toxic strep syndrome, and I had never seen a case of it, but unfortunately, uh, only a few weeks before this, the, the Muppeteer, Jim Henson, had died of toxic strep syndrome, and it became uh, something that doctors who had not previously had too much consciousness of this condition found themselves digging through the literature to read about it. So when Leonard came in with this condition, I, it was fresh on my mind and uh, an amazing coincidence. And uh, so he, Leonard <laughs> survived and thrived. Well, Paul made the diagnosis and I think you had a team of you were directing a team of about 16 physicians <laughs> right. who were coming in and out. And uh, I know that the first night, um, um, our son Miles read the diagnosis, the first night uh, when Len was in the um, emergency, uh, what am I trying to say, was in intensive care. And, and uh, the diagnosis said patient is not supposed to, is not expected to live through the night. 
and Paul was the man who directed the whole team. So it was quite an extraordinary event because it was so new and uh, had nobody really knew about it. So uh, I, I, I say he saved my husband's life. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then your mom, and <laughs> what's an equally amazing story. I, 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 so lucky to be a doctor. See, we would never have met and we, and we had these incredible interactions, but Pauline's mom was found unconscious and she was about a hundred years old at the time, and I'm not exaggerating, <laughs> right? And, um, she and, was in her 90s, yes. And, and so she was brought to Medical City and she stayed unconscious for several days. And she'd been unconscious when you had visited with her a few minutes earlier. And I walk in the room and she's just talking to me. <laughs> like, she's sitting up talking and uh, most casually and she's just fine and she has no idea that she's been unconscious for three days. And, and uh, what could be more amazing than that? So I, I was aware of the miracle of all of this. And I'm not using the word miracle in the way most people use it. I feel like something scientific happened that helped Leonard recover and helped your mother recover. Yeah, but I think, I, I don't claim to know anything about the cause of causes and through what means the cause of causes works, but for a while I was a doctor through which whatever cause of causes worked to True. try to sustain people's physical lives and then I became an author through which that cause of causes uh, helped me spread the word to the extent that I can that, that we're all so amazing and our opportunity to live in this amazing world is not something we should take for granted. So I've, I've been blessed many times over uh, by, by having such a wonderful marriage and such a wonderful wife. and. Uh, the, the people like you, Pauline, that I've had the opportunity to meet have so enriched my life as well. And I think that we have just heard from a man who truly has lived his beliefs and is living his beliefs, and I applaud you for that, and I say, here's to a really fortunate man. Hooray. <laughs> Hooray for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you.